You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is August 25th, 2014, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, human asthma pathogenesis. Our presenter is Dr. Lanny Rosenwasser. He's president of the World Allergy Organization and professor of medicine at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. here that wants to be here, but I'm not. This is being, this is not Lanny J. Rosenwasser, but <laughs> Lenny Wasserman, who is an avatar. Since I'm on, Lanny Rosenwasser is on medical leave and is not allowed to set foot on this property. <laughs> so um, any kind of bad reviews should be sent to Dr. Rosenwasser, but Dr. Wasserman is, is free here. Okay, uh, my disclosures, uh, I'm on the um, Protocol Review Committee of NHLBI AsthmaNet NIH, and we completed a research study from Novartis about two years ago, so it's quoted. Uh, I'm a consultant for a number of these other organizations as listed here. Some of them produce uh, materials that I'll talk about, but I don't believe any of them are approved for anything, so I don't think they're available. And therefore, uh, I don't think that there'll be any conflict in anything I say. The learning objectives are to understand the concept of innate cytokine families and the pathogenesis of asthma in particular. Uh, we're going to be focusing on the end of the talk on the potential emerging biotherapeutics because that's sort of where the pathogenesis has led to. Um, and uh, review preliminary studies specifically about um, the change in paradigm in asthma in terms of the role of uh, inflammatory mediators, in particular the epithelial material. Uh, IL-25, IL-33, and TSLP in asthma. And um, I'd like to give an idea of the complexity in this asthma pathogenesis. Usually when I give this talk, the first year fellows, you know, don't really like it or follow it or understand some of the jargon that I am, I'm talking about. But by the second year, it begins to make a little bit more sense for the second year fellows. So I hope I'm clear enough on that for this. The definition of asthma has really been for the last 25 years, narrowing of airways, airway obstruction, airway inflammation, and increased airway responsiveness. Before the mid-80s, there was actually controversy about the diagnosis of asthma and what the disease was. People still like to talk about how it's a thousand different syndromes, which it probably is. There are probably many ways to become asthmatic. Um, but in the mid-80s, there were two explosions uh, that made a difference in terms of influencing the ideas of pathogenesis. One of them is that pulmonologists, for the most part, became aggressive in sampling the airways. It used to be before 1980 or so, pulmonologists would never bronchoscope an asthmatic for free, fear of triggering status asthmaticus. So no one really knew the pathology or the path, path, immunopathology of, of asthma, which became a very important aspect of uh, research that developed. The other explosion was in the uh, world of immunology. It became clear that there were a certain set of immune responses, predominantly called Th2 type responses based on the type of cytokines made by the T cells that get activated in this response. And it was clear that in uh, asthma and in other allergic diseases, this Th2 compartment was a critical compartment. Not so much the allergists, but the basic immunologists have now moved past calling it Th2 immunity or inflammation. It's now called type 2 inflammation and immunity. So when you read the most up-to-date papers in um, Nature Immunology or Immunity or, or some of the Journal of Experimental Medicine, the leading edge kind of uh, basic research uh, mo models and, and um, and, and sources of articles uh, relating to allergy and asthma on experimental as well as on a translational level. Type 2 inflammation is how this TH2 is now referred to. I, I haven't changed the name on my presentation, but I'll, I'll emphasize it again as we go through some of these things. But needless to say, these four uh, parts were adopted by all parts parties interested, uh, ATS, Quad AI, NHLBI, NIAID, and the development of the NIH guidelines, predominantly through NHLBI, through the National uh, Asthma Expert Plan that uh, first 
emerged in the late 80s, and there's been three or four iterations of these NIH guidelines. The last one was in 2007, as I'll mention, and that was really the end point of one of the ideas of the pathogenesis of asthma. The immunohistopathology that uh, developed from the more aggressive sampling of airway lavage cells and biopsies was that there was denudation of airway epithelium, collagen deposition beneath the basement membrane, so the, not only the, the muscle part of the airway smooth, of the airway bronchi, but the actual structure of it was changed by collagen deposition. There was inflammation with mast cell activation locally and edema and inflammatory cell infiltration. Obviously, eosinophils are probably the primary cell that most people identify with this process, but uh, Th2-like lymphocytes play a role as well. And neutrophils uh, in certain subtypes or phenotypes of asthma play a significant role, maybe not the most or the the most general forms of asthma, but neutrophils contribute to the inflammation, as do many other cells. We'll highlight some of those issues in the next uh, few slides. Uh, but this became the major immunohistopathologic characterization of asthma. And uh, with it was this concept of the airway thickening and the thickened smooth muscle uh, leading to obstruction and also hyper-responsiveness. So, uh, exercise or cold air or methacholine or cholinergic agonists can cause further obstruction of a sensitive airway. And that's the fourth characteristic of the definition of asthma, and probably the most important one when you actually think about what the response to, th to treatment is and really what symptoms are as you go day by day with patients with asthma. The airway remodeling is airway wall thickening, as I just mentioned. It's easy to see in high-resolution CTs of the lung if you do it in an asthmatic, which in a difficult asthmatic should be something that's part of a workup. There's subepithelial fibrosis, increased myocyte mass, and it's not only uh, activation and, um, and multiplication and proliferation of smooth muscle, but there's actually recruitment of fibroblasts to become muscle-like cells, myofibroblasts that are part of this uh, remodeling uh, process, and in the transmitting bronchi that are involved in asthma, uh, there's significant increases in mucus glands and mucus metaplasia, so there's excess production of mucus to go along with this obstruction. And all of that is a set consequence, presumably mostly of the inflammation, but it also may relate to the underlying genetic susceptibility that any individual might have when they develop asthma, because there is significant genetic uh, contributions. The concept of airway remodeling does have a physiologic consequence, and I like thinking about this because this is, helps me put the whole context of, um, of how we deal with asthma. Not so much in pediatric asthma where remodeling is less of an issue, but when you see adult asthmatics who've been battling asthma for 20 or 30 years, on and off inhaled steroids with and without exacerbations, very often when they reach the age of 50 or 55, they have what's known as uh, irreversible or only partially reversible airway obstruction. And this is one of the big conundrums in respiratory medicine. Do they have really asthma or are they a COPD patient who has a little bit of asthma and hyperresponsiveness or both? Are they both related? Michael Holtzman over at uh, Wash U in, PD, in adult pulmonary thinks very much that there's the same susceptibility in young asthmatics and the individuals who develop COPD to airway obstruction, regardless of how they get there. And that's less related to allergens and eosinophils and maybe more related to epithelium and viral insults and other toxicological insults, perhaps like the ones David Bernstein mentioned uh, in the previous colon. Um, so there's partially reversible airway obstruction. So you may have a 55-year-old asthmatic whose airway FEV1 measurement is at about 70 or 75, and if they're given a bronchodilator, it may go to 80 or 85, but doesn't fully reverse. That lack of reversibility is thought to be due to this airway remodeling. And I have to say, clinically speaking, and also in most research studies I've seen, I've never seen a dissociation in a standard uh, asthmatic population between remodeling where it's confirmed by high-resolution CT and airway thickening and bronchial hyperresponsiveness with increased methacholine responsiveness. They sort of go hand in hand. It could be that the methacholine hyperresponsiveness has some key from the inflammation, but it's also likely that there's 
probably inflammation independent effects of that uh, association. There's a paper from Peter Howarth in Southampton two or three years ago in the New England Journal where they took people prone to asthma and who had mild asthma and they restricted their ability of uh, widely expanding their airway and they could show that by doing that sort of mechanical restriction on their airway they can induce some of bronchial hyperresponsiveness. So there may be triggers that are non-inflammatory that can lead to bronchial hyperresponsiveness, but inflammation is another part of that whole process. And the people who are doing that fine dissection are trying to get rid of the inflammation that's mostly there in all the garden variety asthmatics and try and see if there's other structural aspects about the airway that makes a difference. Um, this airway hyperresponsiveness uh, situation where they respond to these uh, agonists that trigger uh, airway construction um, are, is, is the, uh, one of the characteristics of asthma. So when you find it, you have a diagnosis of asthma, whether or not they meet the criteria of 12% improvement of FEV1 with the bronchodilator. They can have less than 12% improvement or no improvement if they're completely normal, as some asthmatics are in terms of having 100% FEV1. But if you do a methacholine test, they'll respond to inhalation of 4 milligrams of methacholine as opposed to 20 milligrams, which a normal uh, individual can inhale 20 milligrams of methacholine and not get any constriction. So hyper-responsiveness is a, an important concept to think about and has clinical importance in terms of dealing with diagnosis of asthma. Maybe you heard about some of that from Salzman when he talked about PFTs a couple weeks ago, or maybe not. He may not have come. He may not have. He may not agree with me. I don't know. Yeah, he had to, he had to skip on us. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, he had, had uh, got tied up. He, he'll be rescheduled now. I see, so I can be Salzman's avatar also. <laughs> Maybe he's on medical leave and wasn't allowed to step into the building. Never know. I don't know. Anyhow, the other point about remodeling that I like to think about too is we all reach the zenith of our FEV1 capabilities, the ability to blow air through our airways at about age 20. That's when it's got the highest level in terms of millimeters of airflow uh, per minute. Uh, when you reach age 20, unfortunately, you start to fall off. So you get to my age where it's pathetic, I'm sure. But you lose a couple of millimeters a year. It's not a huge loss, and it's imperceptible. But that's part of the aging of your lungs. So it brings up the concept that maybe hyperresponsiveness in asthma is related to aging. That's another link in asthma. That's an important biological thing that's intriguing to think about. Most of these things I find interesting to think about. Everybody else thinks are irrelevant or not important, but, but I think that someday, someday people might change their point of view about some of that. So at any rate, when you're normal, uh, you lose 38 or you lose 22 milliliters of your FEV1 per year each year as you go on. If you have asthma and you're not, this is in non-smoking healthy adults who lose 22. If you're an asthmatic, even under good control, um, you tend to average a loss of 38 mLs per year. So their lungs are not the same as normal lungs, independent of smoking, because these studies were done with non-smokers. So it's a uh, it's an important difference, and it's worth remembering that uh, some of it may be that subpopulation of people who get to partially reversible airway obstruction when they're 50 uh, because of remodeling or whatever reason. There's a lot of explanations. I don't want to get too much like Tom Platt's Mills and speculate too much, but uh, this is always a favorite slide of mine because it reminds me of, uh, of the importance of uh, following these kinds of processes. Now, as of 2007, when the third expert panel report uh, came out reiterating the fourth NIH guidelines, and the last one, because they've run out of money to do these kinds of things, and the NHLBI isn't so interested in doing this or repeating it. So the, the idea of pathogenesis in 2007, from all the great minds that were on the expert panel report three, was that there was an immune response that was now clearly a Th2 lymphocyte-driven response, according to them, that led to production of an activation of mast cells, eosinophils, and to some degree neutrophils as well, based on the cytokines produced. Some of the family of cytokines activated the eosinophils. Other groups, particularly the type 2 or Th2 type of cytokines, activated mast cells, neutrophils, through TNF and IL-1, 
uh, and other, other factors generate neutrophil activation in the process. And some of the most difficult to treat severe phenotypes of asthma have a neutrophil rather than eosinophil predominance in their airway. So given the, the confluence of historical events in the 1980s and early 1990s that I described, this was viewed as the, um, as the major paradigm for the immunity inflammation. Um, and then uh, there developed the idea that the epithelium in response to this kind of, a, uh, of an adaptive immune response actually was injured. And uh, predominantly Stephen Holgate and his colleagues at uh, Southampton um, developed this uh, mesenchymal trophil, trophic um, remodeling unit that uh, responded to the um, damage done by the immune inflammatory response that led to the denudation of the airway and the activation of the myofibroblast and smooth muscles to give you the remodeling and the airway obstruction we had just mentioned. But the concept here was that this epithelium was sort of a an inert target for the damage done by this Th2 response. And the idea of these being Th2 cells in the adaptive arm of immune responses, namely the Th2 cells that are mature, have normal T cell receptors that interact with allergens for the most part, there were people, namely Tom Platts Mills, in that era when this was a prominent theory, that went around saying that it, if you inhale two milligrams per hour of air sample of house dust mite, you get sensitized to the house dust mite. But if you inhale 12 milligrams, it's such a strong dose, it induces asthma in those patients. A totally bogus hypothesis that you would expect from somebody who predominantly does epidemiology, where there's no causality, uh, to explain the Th2 predominance of asthma. But this is still a mechanism. And most asthmatics who are atopic and have positive skin tests, which we know there are a lot of them from all the Zolaire that's given, um, you know, have an overlay of that kind of response. But there are other ways to get to this kind of process that go beyond this. I view this as um, the equivalent of Newtonian mechanics in physics. So uh, you have T lymphocytes differentiated and of infinite mass interacting with each other uh, in the Barry K. Sergio Romagnani model in which the Th2s in the asthmatics and allergic individuals overwhelm the Th1s, and the Th1s have to be built up to fight back and overwhelm the Th2s. Another, another grandmother's fairy tale that uh, doesn't explain what the real issue is. Most of the view now on the um, uh, pathogenesis of asthma starts with the epithelium, which is a good place to start. And I don't like these theories that depend just on T cells or just depend on eosinophils or macrophages or neutrophils or epithelium because all of these components are important. And it's probably not just these cells, but the genes and the inflammatory features and the transcription factors and the cytokines that get generated that really pushes the whole process of the inflammation. So occupational toxins, viruses, allergens, particulates that we inhale all attack the epithelium. And there are people who are genetically predisposed to produce certain epithelial cytokines at a higher level that generate a milieu that is more type 2 inflammation oriented. And the critical triumvirate, the Paul Bunyan-esque trio here for inducing this has been the cytokines TSLP, IL-25, which is part of the IL. We a great Toyota RAV4 with Kansas tags. Is this my, with the white? Am I saying that? Sticker on the vehicle. Oh, Except your lights on. That's uh, it's the owner of a gray Toyota Rav4. You'll be in a second. Oh, okay. I thought with the white sticker shows the mercy. I thought security is coming to pick me for uh, pick me up for being yeah, here. Unless on you're driving a Rav4. No, that's not my car. Luckily, so anyhow, let's go through the rest of this pathogenesis because I do want to get done in time because lunchtime is next for most people. Uh, TSLP is in the IL-7 family of cytokines. We'll talk about that in a little bit of detail. IL-25 is part of the IL-17 family. And IL-33 is a prominent part of the IL-1 family. Those standard families of cytokines have epithelial cytokines that probably skew the airway. And probably the predisposition to make more of these cytokines um, skew the GI tract, 
or skew the nose and the epithelium in the nose or skew the skin to have more of an allergic or atopic circumstance. When you have too much IL-33, you generate dendritic cells that activate preferentially the Th2 type lymphocytes, the T cells. So I like this pathogenesis because this is sort of like moving from Newtonian mechanics to really more up-to-date uh, particle physics. So uh, we're now in the realm of Heisenberg as opposed to Newton. But I think that um, uh, the, the, uh, the way in which these cytokines activate any of these kinds of cells and the fact that many of these cells can make a milieu of the cytokines conditions a type 2 inflammatory tissue, no matter where the allergic response might occur. So it's less important what the allergic response is of the specific allergen, which does not mean to say somebody who's cat allergic and has developed the adaptive immune T cells that see the cat allergen or see something else, or the mite allergen or the, the you know, fungal allergens, that if they get a big charge of that kind of exposure after the disease is developed, that they're not going to get an exacerbation. They will. An exacerbation will cause, um, of, of something that they're immune to and allergic to, will cause an exacerbation. But that's not the primary start of how the asthma starts, probably, or any of these other allergic diseases. It's more a local milieu, and then these epithelial-derived processes that sort of drive something down a particular road, if you will, for response. So T cells, once at the center of that thing on the left side of the prior pathogenesis, now we're relegated to this area, which is a especially traumatic to me because I've spent 40 years studying T cells. So we're now back to being part of the regular army. We'll talk about these donated cells in a minute. The eosinophils and mast cells are critical for allergic responses. Neutrophils are inflammatory as well. And some of these factors that will cause um, remodeling as well get produced. And it's not just these cytokines. Chemokines are very active in this process, which we haven't discussed. And, and could be a whole couple of hour lecture in and of themselves. Um, leukotrienes, prostaglandins, uh, histamine, all of these that are present in allergic reactions make a difference. I'm talking about, but none of these things like the leukotrienes, plas, pras, prostaglandins, or histamines cause long-term changes. The cytokines, when they get out there and they're doing their work, those are hormones. And they're doing things long-term in terms of altering the immune response in terms of altering the process that you know we come to respect as an allergic reaction. OK, so this is the new particle physics approach. And it's not only occurring with the cytokines and their receptors, but it's also occurring within the cell uh, itself through signaling factors and transcription factors that can interact to generate inflammatory responses. This is a discussion of primary immune deficiency that's in a an icon that Jack Rudis was the lead author on. It's also in the Journal of Clinical Immunology, not the JACI, because it got rejected from there. <coughs> the interaction of uh, things like um, uh, IRAC4 and, and NEMO and uh, NF-kappa B uh, and AP1 all generate inflammatory signatures that lead to more cytokine synthesis. So the interactions are not just with the milieu of the cytokines in the airway or in the, in the cyto, outside the cytoplasm. These interactions also are occurring in the cells. It just gives you an idea of the degree of complexity that you need to get a normal response or an asthmatic response. And so it's not surprising that with an agent that blocks one class of things that you're going to maybe not get a huge effect or, or whatever. OK, T cells, I think, are at the portion of this immunity that's important in type 2 inflammation. We've been talking about the Th2 cells. Their role outside of allergy and these allergic diseases is host defense against uh, helminths and nematodes and parasitic inflammation. And they're critical for that process. There's no question of that. They're critical in uh, host defense against uh, leprosy and other infectious diseases beyond uh, parasitic infectious disease. Type 1 cells are important for uh, generating immune responses um, against uh, foreign agents, as are Th17 cells in terms of host defense against bacteria, fungi, et cetera. Uh, but they also, both Th1 and Th17 can mediate, um, uh, can mediate the uh, uh, autoimmune response. So those agents, 
that direct themselves to Th17 and Th1 are agents that um, autoimmune intervention has uh, developed. Um, these Th17 cells are not only important in host defense, but they also are important in allergic responses because one of the IL-17 family of proteins is an activator of type 2 inflammation, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute. So Th17 cells are present in asthma and can be playing a role in asthma besides these other circumstances. And there are different cytokine milieus and transcriptions. EVS contact security. EVS contact security. That's not me. EVS contact right now. security. I think they're closing in. They probably heard I'm here. <laughs> so if anybody asks, I'm Lenny Wasserman. Interferon, better take this off. Interferon gamma and IL-12, Tbet is STAT4, are all critical for producing Th1 cells. The IL-4 alone, in the absence of its partner IL-13, is critical for Th2 cells. So that's one of the th factors that differentiates um, IL-4 and IL-13. IL-4 is important for getting Th2 cells. IL-13 does most of the things IL-4 does that, that activate many other inflammatory components of the allergic response. Um, TH17 utilizes uh, TGF-beta and IL-6. So actually blocking IL-6 has been used as a strategy to block TH17 cell activity. Some of those studies have been started to be done in asthma, but they have been done in psoriasis and SLE and shown to be effective. The uh, uh, discovery in the mid-1990s of regulatory T cells, which were CD4, CD25 positive T cells that need and co-express FOXP3 with the transcription factor STAT5 and the influence of TGF-beta and IL-2, critically important. These regulatory T cells block the effects of some of these other innate and non-innate um, non types of cells that make cytokines. So they're like the old suppressor cells in that they can suppress an immune response and they rise tremendously during a course of immunotherapy. First identified by uh, Chesmiactis and um, Kurt Blaser and Marek Utel in Switzerland where they looked at beekeepers who uh, went underwent immunotherapy with Vespid venoms who developed huge quantities of these T regulatory cells during immunotherapy. Now in every form of immunotherapy, no matter what the allergen and even in SWIT, these uh, T regulatory cells are very important to get a good response in immunotherapy. Uh, they express TGF beta, not TGF register. <laughs> I guess that sort of looks like a patent. <laughs> it's a registered trademark. It's a registered trademark. <laughs> it is, I'm sure, for someone. But it's TGF beta and IL-10 that are both secreted as well as expressed on the membrane of these T regulatory cells that either kill or inhibit the other T cells from activating. They're suppressive to other cells. They must co-express FOXP3. You could have CD4 positive, CD25 positive T cells that are activated that don't express FOXP3 that are just part of the memory cell uh, activation process. For example, if someone's allergic to influenza, or not allergic, if they're immune to influenza, you can get a T regulatory cell activation um, that's memory in the absence of FOXP3 to the influenza. IL-35 amongst the cytokines is a major growth factor for these T regulatory cells. People have been trying to use these cells to limit autoimmune diseases. So people uh, in newly diagnosed type 1 diabetes, for example, have expanded T regulatory cells in vitro and then retransfused them back to some of the children with type 1 diabetes to limit uh, the type 1 diabetes. So they, it, this is, they've been used in tumor models. It's not just a fanciful part of, uh, of allergen immunotherapy. Although allergen immunotherapy was one of the hallmarks of the way in which the recognition of these cells was, uh, was propagated. So these are very important in biology as well as in allergy. Okay? There are other sets. It's incredibly confusing. Every year or two, there's a New England Journal article or a Jackie article about every month or so about some of these other kinds of cells. So NKT and innate NKT cells are important cells because they make different cytokine profiles that could influence the amount and the limit of type 2 inflammation. So they, they can enhance it or inhibit it. Gamma-delta T cells have been known now as long as the alpha-beta cells were known 
their exact function isn't known, but they have sentinel effects in most of the epithelial tissues. Uh, there are Th22 cells that produce IL-22, and they come from the CD4 lineage, probably the Th17 lineage, um, that are very prominent in psoriasis and in atopic dermatitis. So these Th22 cells are another sub-subtype. The Th9 cells are derived from the, uh, the Th2 cells, and they're also producing IL-9 as one of the Th2 type cytokines, thought to have a slightly different function from Th2, uh, in that IL-9 is thought to be a major mast cell activator. And so you can cut down on mast cell activation by blocking IL-9 in experimental models. Um, but the value of blocking IL-9 in clinical trials hasn't yet emerged as a, as a major weapon. And then there are follicular T cells within lymphoid tissues that aren't defined in any way with this circumstance um, in terms of their function. But they've been defined in terms of the literature. The gamma delta T cells are the so-called double negative cells. So when you read a flow and they're double negatives but CD4 positive, they're gamma deltas. They have neither CD4 nor CD8 uh, on their surface. <coughs> okay. What's come up in the past three or four years this is kind of interesting. Uh, the basic immunologists have found out that the um, the basic immunologists found out that there are other cells in the airway uh, that are involved and in other tissues, lymphoid tissues, uh, GI epithelium, etc. And these cells were initially called newocytes because no one knew what they really were, uh, but they now have an official name. It's called innate lymphoid cells. One of the other basic immunological advances in all of this is it was thought in the era of Romagnani and Barry Kay that these cells are terminally differentiated. So when you had a Th2 cell, it lived out its life as a Th2 cell. We now know that the tissues are very dynamic and there are stem cells and precursors that make all sorts of cytokines in that milieu. So you can have a fully differentiated Th2 cell that differentiates back to a Th0 and could become a T regulatory cell or could become a TH17 cell depending on how it's stimulated with those cytokines and transcription factors. So um, it's, it's a very complicated circumstance uh, from that point of view. And the innate lymphoid cells now are grouped into 1, 2, and 3 depending on which cytokines they make. Uh, group 1 make TH1 cytokines, group 2 make TH2, and group 3 make IL-17 and IL-22. So it's simple from that point of view. Anyhow, what I'm trying to do about this pathogenesis is to give you an idea of how complex it is. Several orders of complexity more than we like to think about. We like to get a, a schema, schema that identifies the epithelium and the Th2 and the different kinds of cells and figure that that's the, the end of the word. But it's, it actually depends on the microbiome, the proteome, transcriptome, and genome, and then the organization of tissues, organs, whole body, brain, it's not only neural control over these tissues from the local nerves, but your CNS could influence in hormonal ways the way in which the immune response can occur. And it also is not just in at any one point in time. At any point in time, it's all three dimensions. So when we show a picture of uh, IL-17 interacting with a receptor, it's not just on a cartoon. It's three-dimensionally how it has to work. So the antibodies and the drugs have to block that three-dimensional interactions at a cellular level for it to have an effect. Um, and it, it, it's all, uh, there's a fourth dimension involved. I hate to be too physics-oriented. Maybe I'm doing this for Jay. He's probably not listening because he's on telemedicine, but he's a big fan of physics, I guess. And this is uh, my physics deposition here. Uh, but, you know, uh, fourth dimension is important as well in that what you have at time zero or uh, the process, what you have at age zero or prenatally changes in time and exposures and other factors that are not easily comprehended right off the bat might be very important during the developmental or fourth dimensional aspect of this process. Okay, well, it's not as if just the pathogenesis is complex and hard to get your brain around um, expert panel three had a six-step approach to the therapy. So it's not as if the therapy is uh, well delineated for all these different endotypes and phenotypes that have been developed in clusters 
uh, overweight women who are past menopause, who have a lot of neutrophils in their airway or some with a lot of eosinophils, the people in Leicester in the UK and the Severe Asthma Research Program in the US have gone to great lengths defining five to eight different clusters of asthmatics. And it's easy to understand some of them, the exercise and uh, the uh, you know aspirin sensitive groups, but some of these other groups that are delineated may or may not turn out to be real endotypes. And how they respond to the different treatments is still up in the air as well. We all know the long-term controlling medications that are listed here, um, and the quick relief medications that uh, are listed here as well. Uh, anticholinergics have come under a lot of recent scrutiny because teotropium, which is a longer-acting anticholinergic, has been set, found to be a bronchodilator. So in the individuals who don't respond to LABAs in terms of the long-term control, some of them may respond to teotropium. Uh, the studies are prominently adults, so most of the indications about this are totally unknown in children with teotropium. But I think in adults, especially the ones who don't make a good bronchodilator response, some of them are not going to respond to anything because they're remodeled. Some of them may respond to teotropium, may have to do with their genetics. That's a simple explanation. It's probably much more complex than that. But there have been a lot of uh, studies in the New England Journal the past three years identifying teotropium as an alternative bronchodilator to the lavas, especially since the lavas got a black box. In allergy, we only have one biotherapeutic at this particular time. So I'll spend the last five or seven minutes talking about the emerging biotherapeutics. And I probably won't have enough time to go into them in great detail, but I'll touch on them. Anti-IgE has been available now 10 or 11 years in the US. It's a step people move to when they have a step four or five type of asthmatic who's not made the best responses. And um, in those who are allergic, it's, uh, it's a very good add-on. But there are still exacerbations and an unmet need for things beyond Zolaire in severe asthma or even moderately severe asthma. So we need more than just Zolaire. Zolaire is a big step forward because the agents that were used before that, namely things like methotrexate or IVIG at high dose or other kinds of things like that were expensive or toxic and essentially non-effective. So Zoers occupied a niche. We have to become like the rheumatologists now who have like 10 or 12 biotherapeutics that emerge from just the TNF blockers. We have IgE blockers, but we need to get about five or six other biotherapeutics that will make a difference in terms of treating this kinds of patients. Because down the road, I think the way in which the asthmatics that are difficult will make their best response if you have a combination of Zolaire with an anti-cytokine antagonist, the combination of Zolaire with something that directs IL-17 activity. So I think those are the ways of the future. The biotherapeutics for your practicing era are going to be the major treatment in the next 25 to 30 years. Whether the pharmaceuticals like it or whether somebody like Jay likes it, uh, it's, there's no question of it. And the cost will have to be brought in line with what's necessary to treat that population of disease, that's happening in other disease categories. The cost of production of these antibodies are going down. There are going to be biosimilar biotherapeutics that are come on the market that are like generics that will drive it down as well. So these are going to be our therapeutic tools. So it behooves you to learn them, even if there are some people who drag their feet about it. And even if you don't like it, it's something you're going to have to use probably at some point in the future. For me, I don't know if I have 30 years down the line, but I think, uh, but I'm thinking about it. So let's at least have, have that. There are emerging anti-IL-1 categories, anti-IL-5, anti-IL-13, uh, anti-IL-17, and combinations. There's one combination that's made a big splash of an anti-IL-4, anti-IL-13. And these are some of the other ones that have actually been tried. None of them have reached the market yet, but we'll highlight something with some of them. Um, the anti-IL-5 agents have been very useful uh, in the treatment of the hyper syndrome and are used in that, even though they haven't been approved to it yet. Uh, once again, highlighting one of the faults of the FDA. Uh, it's also effective in asthma, and some of these, I think, will be approved in the next 12 months without any question. Certainly the MEPO and the Rezolizumab, Benrolizumab works a little differently on the IL-5 receptor, but also there's very... Um, promising preliminary information on it uh, influencing asthma as well. 
IL-4 blockers uh, alone have not been useful. There's one called Nuvans that many years ago was like Embro uh, and never really made it past phase two trials. Pitrokinra is in that same category. Pascalizumab is an antibody specifically just for IL-4. There are a couple of anti-IL-13 agents that are on the market, or not on the market yet, that will vie to be on the market. Lebrokizumab has made a splash because you could show that the individuals who are more prone to type 2 inflammation through the production of the biomarker periostin make a strong response to leprechizumab. I don't think that's in my presentation, but if I ever talk about cytokines again to you, <coughs> it'll come up. And um, the new fellows, uh, you have new uh, a new, Har a new not Harrison, that's internal medicine, a new Middleton. So I would recommend the cytokine chapter based on my presentation because it's very well written. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, um, uh, anti-IL-4-13 combination with pilumab has been shown very preliminarily in asthma and atopic dermatitis to be very useful. The other point I want to make about Zolaire is the asthma indication is useful, but it works even better in urticaria for whatever reason. Uh, at least very preliminarily, it looks to me like it's a better fit in urticaria. So dupilumab also works in atopic dermatitis, whereas Zoair doesn't. And dupilumab looks very promising in uh, asthma. There's an Amgen antibody, AMG157, that's directed against TSLP. That is in early trials. Got a paper in the New England Journal. Oh, TSLP is thymic stromal lymphopoietin. It's an epithelial cytokine in the IL-7 family activate cells of innate immunity, dendritic cells, uh, mast cells, um, monocytes, uh, CD34 pr progenitor cells, and innate lymphoid cells. It skews TH2 expression and type 2 immunity is in the new lingo. And expression correlates with asthma and airway severity. Genetic variants have been associated with atopy asthma and uh, uh, airways hyperresponsiveness. There was a paper from Paul O'Byrne and Gail Gavro in the New England Journal, I think in May, May or June, that demonstrated that the uh, anti-TSLP blocked the late phase response with a uh, aeroallergen challenge. So there's reason to believe that TSLP, therefore, might work as a anti-TSLP, might work as an agent. Uh, IL-1 and asthma and allergy, we've published a lot in this area. We started it by cloning IL-1, uh, but we showed that a asthma, airway, macrophages and, and lavage had a lot of IL-1 beta in asthma, and that IL-1 directly activates CD4, uh, TH2, and TH17 cells uh, in papers that have come out with more sophisticated measurements of CD4 T cell activation, and there are the references are all there. The extended IL-1 family of, uh, of uh, um, inflammatory cytokines include IL-18, which has a shared receptor in genetics, uh, IL-33, which you'll hear a little bit more about, we've already heard something, and IL-37, which appears to be an antagonist for IL-33. In fact, IL-1-alpha-beta and IL-1-RA, these were the agonists for inflammatory effects, and IL-1-RA, the receptor alpha, was the antagonist. And there's another pod, IL-33, IL-37, and a couple of these other ones where, indeed, it looks like an agonist and then natural antagonist. So the development of these cytokines was an inflammatory host defense kind of approach. And having the antagonist as kind of a servo mechanism to limit the damage that these might do in generating a host defense. So I like to think about this from an evolutionary point of view, and it fits. Almost all of these genes are on chromosome 2Q13 except for IL-33, which is IL-1F11 amongst the gene. These are the gene names. These are the other names and what their activity is. But IL-33 is on chromosome 9, not on chromosome 2. But it's probably migrated there as part of, as during DNA evolution and other things of that sort. Uh, and these just are the names of some of the newer cytokines. We're up to IL-38, in case anyone's interested. Some of them are mostly IL-1 family. We have three agents, anakinra, which is known as kinerit, which is used in pediatric juvenile arthritis, as well as in adult stills as an anti-inflammatory agent. 
It requires a high concentration and a daily injection, but it's been involved in arthritis treatment for a couple of years, so it's been available. There is something called Rolanicept, which is an IL-1 receptor trap, which also blocks free IL-1, and an antibody, which I personally think is the best of all these agents in terms of blocking IL-1, called Canakinumab. These are all approved by the FDA for the CAP syndrome in pediatrics. So the, all the inflammatory syndromes that are cryopyrin or pyrin or related, FMF, uh, chronic familial urticaria, periodic fever, some of the TNF defects, all utilize these agents as treatment, and they're approved for that indication. Uh, one of them, canakinumab, has been shown to be effective in preventing gout attacks. But FDA didn't approve it for gout because they thought it was too expensive compared to colchicine to uh, <laughs> have on the market. And this is just the biology of those things. Um, IL-33 is critically important because it's one of those critical epithelial cytokines to skews to type 2 inflammation. And its receptor is known as ST2. And ST2 is one of the markers for identifying a Th2 type of lymphocyte. So it's on the Th2 lymphocyte. When those lymphocytes get activated, a soluble form gets generated that actually can travel in the circulation with IL-33. But the actual IL-33 binds to ST2 in a cell. It uses an IL-1 accessory protein to activate NF-kappa B, P38 kinase, and junk kinases in terms of cellular activation. So it's very important that way. And when that happens on dendritic cells, the dendritic cells become more prone to activate Th2 cells and make a milieu where there's a lot of IL-4 and IL-10 uh, so that uh, Th2 cells come up. Uh, there are multiple genetic studies that identify IL-33 and its receptor as being highly replicated jink links to genetics of asthma. And there, the IL-1-like cytokine uh, fold of the precursor uh, IL-33 is very, very similar and has about 80% homology at the protein level to all of these IL-1 family proteins. So it's uh, well defined. I only list this because it identifies all the targets of IL-33. In case you want to go through this more slowly, uh, it's on the desktop here, and you can, you're can you welcome to take it and move it and email it to yourselves. I only put it up here because I made a similar slide 25 years ago that all showed all the targets of IL-1. <laughs> so it's the same deal with IL-33. So the uh, evolving model is that IL-33 is a major air, um, process. Kristen Anthony's left. Oh, sorry, boring her, but I think uh, we're getting close to time anyhow, so we're getting close to finishing. Um, IL-33 can do all these different things that are influence type 2 immunity, so there'll be an anti-IL-33 that's coming down the pipe that will be in trial as well, as you can imagine. The IL-17 family is an important family for making these Th17 cells. Um, there are a bunch of antibodies that have been some approved uh, that blocks the IL-6 receptor. By having no IL-6, you don't get any Th17. So this one, tocilizumab, has been approved for psoriasis, RA, and SLE. Some of these other ones have been approved for a couple of these indications. There was a report in the Blue Journal over the winter by Bill Bussey uh, looking at tocilizumab in asthma in a phase 2B trial, 2A trial where they didn't have enough individuals in five advancing groups to see an effect of the anti-IL-6. But broader trials will be coming down the road for all of these IL-17 targets. So you know, there's a lot of ways in which we're going to be uh, treating asthma in the future based on its complexity and learning more about these endotypes and phenotypes and what the biomarkers are, who's going to respond. The cost of these biotherapeutics is daunting. But if we can find out who's going to respond and who's not based on Th2 inflammation or type 2, whatever you want to call it, based on neutrophils, based on other biomarkers that are yet to be fully developed, I mean, there's no lack of targets in any of these kinds of cellular models, all these two-dimensional models. A bunch of these things have been tried. None of them have made it except for Zolaire. But some of these other ones are getting close. So I think some of the anti-IL-5 materials are going to be approved for asthma, I think, within the next year. The IL-4, IL-13 uh, population of these, anti-IL-13 will make a difference as well. So um, 
when I was president of the Quad AI, I, I gave a visionary presidential talk that no one attended or listened to, and it was probably worthwhile that they didn't. But I thought that we're going to need a systems biology approach to these cascades to figure out exactly how these complex interactions work. And that's, people think, well, genomics and informatics are going to answer that through systems biology. I don't think so. I think we're going to need a brighter way to organize that kind of approach with information theory, which is a little bit different than informatics. But that's a, a, a physics term that maybe Jay and I can discuss. Biotherapeutics in most of your career is going to be the hallmark of treatment, not just for asthma, but all the other allergic diseases. Even if uh, steroids are dirt cheap, these things are going to be proven to be better. It's the same way with moderate ar rheumatoid arthritis now. I would doubt that there's a lot of the RAs newly diagnosed who are placed on methotrexate, except if they're on Medicaid or something like that. Most of them are getting Embrel or Umira or some other kind of TNF blocker. And I think that uh, this is going to influence us. Um, it may help with pharmacogenetic, pharmacogenetic profiling and most importantly, early intervention. See, these are biologics that are part of the body's own response. You might be able to model um, early intervention and prevention. So that's it. I uh, always like to show this. <laughs> I've been showing it now for 30 years, and it's still the same. The WOW Journal, I used to be the editor. It's now Alessandro Fiocchi from Italy. It's an up-and-coming journal. It's about to get an impact factor. Uh, it's gone on PubMed Central uh, since January, since a year ago, January, and it's had some very important papers and will continue to be an important journal, we think, in allergy. Uh, we have a meeting in Rio de Janeiro in December in WAO. Since, uh, since my avatar, Lanny Rosenwasser, was uh, listed as the WOW president, I'm Lenny Wasserman since I don't want to make any problems for medical leave. So. Got it. <laughs> oh. Yep, come on in. We're just about done with cola. Yep. I'm done. We're going to be in Seoul, Korea in the fall of 2015, so you're all invited there, too. And uh, these are going to be really good meetings. And thank you. Sorry. Thanks for uh, the presentation. How are you? Fantastic.